Chapter 1. Why are you running? I'll race you to the corner, Ellen. Anne Marie adjusted the thick leather pack on her back so that her school books balanced evenly. Ready? She looked at her best friend. Ellen made a face. No, she said, laughing. You know I can't beat you. My legs aren't as long. Can we just walk like civilized people? She was a stocky ten-year-old, unlike lanky Anne Marie. We have to practice for the athletic meet on Friday. I know I'm going to win the girls' race this week. I was second last week, but I've been practicing every day. Come on, Ellen, Anne Marie pleaded, eyeing the distance to the next corner of the Copenhagen Street. Please? Ellen hesitated, then nodded and shifted her own rucksack of books against her shoulders. Oh, all right. Ready, she said. Go, shouted Anne Marie, and the two girls were off, racing along the residential sidewalk. Anne Marie's silvery blonde hair flew behind her, and Ellen's dark pigtails bounced against her shoulders. Wait for me, wailed little Kirsty, left behind, but the two older girls weren't listening. Anne Marie outdistanced her friend quickly, even though one of her shoes came untied as she sped along the street called Austin Brigade. Past the small shops and cafes of her neighborhood here in northeast Copenhagen. Laughing, she skirted an elderly lady in black who carried a shopping bag made of string. A young woman pushing a baby in a carriage moved aside to make way. The corner was just ahead. Anne Marie looked up, panting, just as she reached the corner. Her laughter stopped. Her heart seemed to skip a beat. Halt! The soldier ordered in a stern voice. The German word was as familiar as it was frightening. Anne Marie had heard it often enough before, but it had never been directed at her until now. Behind her, Ellen also slowed and stopped. Far back, little Kirsty was plodding along, her face in a pout because the girls hadn't waited for her. Anne Marie stared up. There were two of them. That meant two helmets, two set of cold eyes glaring at her, and four tall, shiny boots planted firmly on the sidewalk, blocking her path to home. And it meant two rifles gripped in the hands of the soldiers. She stared at the rifles first. Then, finally, she looked into the face of a soldier who had ordered her to halt. "'Why are you running?' the harsh voice asked. His Danish was very poor." Three years, Anne Marie thought with contempt. Three years they've been in our country and they still can't speak our language. I was racing with my friend, she answered politely. We have races at school every Friday and I want to do well, so I... Her voice trailed away. The sentence unfinished. Don't talk so much, she told herself. Just answer them, that's all. She glanced back. Ellen was motionless on the sidewalk a few yards behind her. Farther back, Kirsty was still sulking and walking slowly toward the corner. Nearby, a woman had come to the doorway of a shop and was standing silently, watching. One of the soldiers, the taller one, moved toward her. Anne Marie recognized him as the one she and Ellen always called, in whispers, the giraffe, because of his height and the long neck that extended from his stiff collar. He and his partner were always on this corner. He prodded the corner of her backpack with the stock of his rifle. Anne-Marie trembled. What is in here? he asked loudly. From the corner of her eye, she saw the shopkeeper move quietly back into the shadows of the doorway, out of sight. School books, she answered truthfully. Are you a good student? the soldier asked. He seemed to be sneering. Yes. What is your name? Anne-Marie Johansson. Your friend. Is she a good student, too? He was looking beyond her at Ellen, who hadn't moved. Anne-Marie looked back, too, and saw that Ellen's face, usually rosy-cheeked, was pale and her dark eyes were wide. She nodded at the soldier. Better than me, she said. What is her name? Ellen. And who is this? he asked, looking to Anne Marie's side. Kirsty had appeared there suddenly, scowling at everyone. My little sister. She reached down for Kirsty's hand, but Kirsty, always stubborn, refused it and put her hands on her hips defiantly. 
The soldier reached down and stroked her little sister's tangled curls. Stand still, Kirsty, and Marie ordered silently, praying that somehow the obstinate five-year-old would receive the message. But Kirsty reached up and pushed the soldier's hand away. Don't, she said loudly. Both soldiers began to laugh. They spoke to each other in rapid German that Anne-Marie couldn't understand. She is pretty, like my own little girl, the tall one said in a more pleasant voice. Anne-Marie tried to smile politely. Go home, all of you. Go study your school books and don't run. You look like hoodlums when you run. The two soldiers turned away. Quickly, Anne-Marie reached down again and grabbed her sister's hand before Kirsty could resist. Hurrying the little girl along, she rounded the corner. In a moment, Ellen was beside her. They walked quickly, not speaking, with Kirsty between them, toward the large apartment building where both families lived. When they were almost home, Ellen whispered suddenly, I was so scared. Me too, Anne-Marie whispered back. As they turned to enter their building, both girls looked straight ahead toward the door. They did it purposefully, so that they would not catch the eyes or the attention of two more soldiers who stood with their guns on this corner as well. Kirsty scurried ahead of them through the door, chattering about the picture she was bringing home from kindergarten to show Mama. For Kirsty, the soldiers were simply part of the landscape, something that had always been there on every corner, as unimportant as lampposts throughout her remembered life. Are you going to tell your mother? Ellen asked Anne-Marie as they trudged together up the stairs. I'm not. My mother would be upset. No, I won't either. Mama would probably scold me for running on the street. She said goodbye to Ellen on the second floor where Ellen lived and continued on to the third, practicing in her mind a cheerful greeting for her mother, a smile, a description of today's spelling test in which she had done well. But she was too late. Kirsty had gotten there first, and he poked Anne Marie's book bag with his gun, and then he grabbed my hair. Kirsty was chattering as she took off her sweater in the center of the apartment living room, but I wasn't scared. Anne Marie was, and Ellen too, but not me. Mrs. Johansen rose quickly from the chair by the window where she'd been sitting. Mrs. Rosen, Ellen's mother, was there too, in the opposite chair. They had been having coffee together, as they did many afternoons. Of course, it wasn't really coffee, though. The mother still called it that, having coffee. There had been no real coffee in Copenhagen since the beginning of the Nazi occupation. Not even any real tea. The mother sipped at hot water flavored with herbs. Anne Marie, what happened? What is Kirsty talking about? Her mother asked anxiously. Where's Ellen? Mrs. Rosen had a frightened look. Ellen's in your apartment. She didn't realize you were here, Anne Marie explained. Don't worry, it wasn't anything. It was the two soldiers who stand on the corner of Austin Brigade. You've seen them. You know, the tall one with the long neck, the one who looks like a silly giraffe. She told her mother and Mrs. Rosen of the incident, trying to make it sound humorous and unimportant. But their uneasy looks didn't change. I slapped his hand and shouted at him, Kirsty announced importantly. No, she didn't, Mama, Anne-Marie reassured her mother. She's exaggerating, as she always does. Mrs. Johansen moved to the window and looked down to the street below. The Copenhagen neighborhood was quiet. It looked the same as always, people coming and going from the shops, children at play, the soldiers on the corner. She spoke in a low voice to Ellen's mother. They must be edgy because of the latest resistance incidents. Did you read in the Dufredonks about the bombings in Hillrod and Norbro? Although she pretended to be absorbed in the unpacking of her school books, Anne-Marie listened, and she knew what her mother was referring to. Dufredonks, the Free Danes, was an illegal newspaper. Peter Nielsen brought it to them occasionally, carefully folded and hidden among ordinary books and papers, and Mama always burned it after she and Papa had read it. But Anne-Marie heard Mama and Papa talk, sometimes at night, about the news they received that way. News of sabotage against the Nazis, bombs hidden and exploded, 
and the factories that produced war materials and industrial railroad lines damaged so that the goods couldn't be transported. And she knew what resistance meant. Papa had explained when she overheard the word and asked, The resistance fighters were Danish people, no one knew who, because they were very secret, who were determined to bring harm to the Nazis however they could. They damaged the German trucks and cars and bombed their factories. They were very brave. Sometimes they were caught and killed. I must go and speak to Ellen, Mrs. Rosen said, moving toward the door. You girls walk a different way to school tomorrow. Promise me, and Marie, and Ellen will promise too. We will, Mrs. Rosen, but what does it matter? There are German soldiers on every corner. They will remember your faces, Mrs. Rosen said, turning in the doorway to the hall. It is important to be one of the crowd always. Be one of many. Be sure that they never have reason to remember your face. She disappeared into the hall and closed the door behind her. He'll remember my face, Mama, Kirsty announced happily, because he said I look like his little girl. He said I was pretty. If he has such a pretty little girl, why doesn't he go back to her like a good father? Mrs. Johansen murmured, stroking Kirsty's cheek. Why doesn't he go back to his own country? Mama, is there anything to eat? Anne Marie asked, hoping to take her mother's mind away from the soldiers. Take some bread and give a piece to your sister. With butter? Kirsty asked hopefully. No butter, her mother replied. You know that. Kirsty sighed as Anne Marie went to the bread box in the kitchen. I wish I could have a cupcake, she said. A big yellow cupcake with pink frosting. Her mother laughed. For a little girl, you have a long memory, she told Kirsty. There hasn't been any butter or sugar for cupcakes for a long time. A year at least. When will there be cupcakes again? When the war ends, Mrs. Johansen said. She glanced through the window down to the street corner where the soldiers stood, their faces impassive beneath the metal helmets. When the soldiers leave...